Well, thank you, Bruce and Barbara, uh, treasured friends from our high school days. It's so wonderful to be back here at Logan High, though I don't recognize anything about this building here. It's really changing. We're working on getting the sound set up right. Uh, I treasure my years here and my friends that I made, and I'm so pleased that I've been able to come back to, I think, every class reunion that we've had since we graduated in 1958. So I want to begin now by taking you very, very far away, 1.3 billion years ago. Back when multicelled life was just beginning to spread over the Earth, but in a galaxy far, far away, two black holes circled around and around each other. Can you get the lights completely off, please? Uh, these are the black holes. These are actually the shadows made by the black holes uh, that are in front of a star field. And this is a uniform star field. But you see all these patterns in here, which, I, as I shall describe, is caused by the lensing, by the black holes acting like lenses to bend the starlight to make these patterns. And as these black holes orbit around and around each other, just like the moon orbits around the Earth, uh, they emitted ripples of uh, warping in the fabric of space and time. They traveled outward, carrying away the orbital energy, so the black holes spiraled closer and closer together, and then in a huge cataclysm, they collided and merged and produced a very strong burst of gravitational waves, a burst so strong that it carried off the same amount of energy as you would get by annihilating three suns and turning all of that into gravitational energy that went flying away. And these gravitational waves, and I'll describe the physical nature of the gravitational waves a little bit later, they traveled out of the galaxy in which those two black holes lived into the great reaches of intergalactic space. Across the intergalactic space for 1.3 billion years, uh, until uh, about 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, these uh, gravitational waves arrived at the outer edges of our Milky Way galaxy. They then traveled into the Milky Way galaxy, reached the Earth on 14 September 2015. They arrived at the Earth in the Antarctic Peninsula, traveled upward through the Earth unscathed, unaffected by all the matter in the Earth, arrived at a detector called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Detector, in Livingston, Louisiana. And seven milliseconds later, they arrived at a similar detector in Hanford, Washington. They shook these detectors uh, ever so slightly, but strong enough that it showed up very strongly on our instruments. Uh, the signal went into the instruments and was recorded, and uh, it was then studied for a matter of about four months with great care by the team that had built these instruments and was working with the data, a team of a thousand scientists and engineers uh, from all around the world. And these are just a small fraction of a thousand scientists and engineers. Uh, the uh, gravitational wave signal, uh, ultimately uh, the team decided this really was a gravitational wave signal, that, they had, that it was not due to internal noise, it was the real thing and announced it to the world, and it made front page headlines all around the world, uh, here in Austria, in New York City. On October 3rd, 2017, at 2.15 a.m. in California, I got a call, a telephone call, uh, from, and you can bring the lights back up now, uh, a telephone call from the Nobel Prize Committee. And the man on the other end, who is the uh, Secretary General of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, he said to me, it will not surprise you that the Nobel Prize for Physics for 2017 is being awarded to you, Rainer Weiss, and Barry Marish for the discovery of gravitational waves. I told him it doesn't surprise me, but I'm very disappointed. Uh, I would have thought that by now you would have figured out that um, things, discoveries of this sort, that it is a team effort 
and that the team is the ones that deserve the Nobel Prize. It should have gone to the thousand scientists who all played crucial roles in making this thing happen. It shouldn't go to just three people. Uh, he said, well, uh, we've been talking about that, but we have not reached the point where we're willing to give it to uh, a team, and we'll have that conversation with you when you're in Stockholm. So in Stockholm, we had the conversation, and the, my, my point was that, that their whole goal is to uh, make the general public understand the importance of science, and uh, to promote science. And they think that three people are better icons for science than a whole team. But it seems to me that there are other responsibilities to inform the world about how science is done. And much of science today can only be done by collaboration. The collaborations are absolutely essential. They can, uh, this could not have ever been done by three people. It could only be done by a large collaboration. So anyway, they, they're still thinking about it. And, uh, so I regard myself as an icon for this big team. So how did I get there? I want to go back to 1940. I was born here in Logan in 1940. Uh, I, I grew up initially in the fifth ward and then we moved down uh, to the first ward. Uh, and when I uh, was younger than eight, I had an aspiration. My dream was to become a snowplow delay. <laughs> <laughs> because when you lived through the winter of 1948, where the snow was deeper than uh, I think any of us ever saw at any other time in our lives, and you saw the snow pushed up along the snow banks in front of our house up on the boulevard to heights of, uh, that were maybe four or five times higher than I was tall. This clearly was the most powerful job in the world. <laughs> but then when I was eight years old, my mother took me to a lecture about the solar system by a, by a Utah State University a geology professor. Uh, at the fifth ward, it was an MIA meeting, and uh, she snuck me in as an eight-year-old uh, to that meeting with her young adults. And I just became totally fascinated by the idea of the solar system, and I decided I'm going to become an astronomer when I grow up. To heck with the uh, snow cloud, I could an astronomer. Uh, but then when I was 13 years old, here I am at 13, together with my mother and my three siblings, of whom Sandra is here uh, with us today as well. Uh, I uh, ran across in Salt Lake City a book by George Gamow, who was a physicist at the University of Colorado in Boulder. It was called One, Two, Three, Infinity, and it was a book that was a revelation for me in which I came to understand that there are fundamental laws of physics, or laws of nature, which uh, govern how the universe behaves. Uh, they control what goes on in the astronomical sky. Uh, and they're written in the language of mathematics. And I decided, I, what I really want to do is understand those laws of nature that, that control the universe. I wanted to be a physicist. And so here I am. I'm a physicist who works on astronomy. Uh, in this book, there was a, a wonderful drawing of a four-dimensional cube. I'm not going to explain how this works. Uh, but it's called a tesseract. And those of you who have seen the movie Interstellar, the Tesseract plays a big role in, in that movie. Well, this is where the Tesseract came from for me. Uh, and uh, so I got really fascinated by the geometry of what could go on in four dimensions. And our universe just has three dimensions, east, west, north, south, up, down, and that's it. If you had four dimensions, what would it be like? Well, this is a picture, that, as I say, I won't explain you. You'll look it up on the web. Uh, that uh, shows you just a little bit of that. Now, as we've said, I was in the class of 1958 in high school. We had some superb teachers. Uh, we had Harry Kemp for physics. I'm thinking about the science and math teachers. Uh, we had Mr. Lambert for uh, chemistry. And we had Harry Thomas uh, for mathematics. And Harry Thomas had a particular impact on me because of this issue of uh, geometry. Uh, we learned Euclidean geometry. I don't think people nowadays probably learn much of this, but this is where you lay out some axioms and you prove theorems about what could go on in geometry. We began and did almost all of it on the geometry of a plane, uh, that is lines and curves, circles, uh, squares, rectangles in a plane and their properties. And then we did a little bit of three-dimensional uh, geometry about cubes and uh, surfaces and so forth. And so then, uh, I, for myself, for a science project, decided I would do the same thing in four dimensions because I had been so fascinated by uh, this. And so I learned 
uh, that's two and three dimensions from Harry Thomas, and uh, this was my science project in high school, was four dimensions. And I'm going to return to four dimensions because that has a lot to do with gravitational waves and uh, the work that I've done. Merlin Olson, uh, of all my classmates, he, of course, is the one who is the most famous, but he was also a very close friend of mine. Uh, Merlin and I first met in an irrigation ditch playing with toads. <laughs> His father and my father uh, were soil scientists, and they were out uh, doing uh, mucking around with the soil in some scientific way, and we were mucking around with toads. This was age three or four, and uh, then we basically remained friends then through, uh, up through high school, and uh, we were quite close. We were debate partners, as it was said. Uh, and uh, of course, this is uh, the uh, uh, photo photograph that is in the public mind about Merlin. But uh, what you would not normally see is this photograph. This is my wedding. Merlin was best man. Of course, he towers over me. Uh, and this is me, and this is my first wife, Linda, who unfortunately was not able to come to this class reunion. But my second wife, my current wife, uh, Carolee, is, is, and she's here yet. Uh, uh, is here. Is here. Uh, both uh, Linda and Carolee went with me to Stockholm for the uh, Nobel festivities. And the press in Stockholm had a little bit of difficulty uh, with this. Uh, anyway, that's the story. I, I need to go up talk about that. Uh, this, of course, is Merlin's wife, Susan, who's here with us. It's, it's so sad that Merlin is not here. But it was great reading Susan just a few minutes ago. I and Patty Mickle, uh, Susan's uh, cousin, we were the ones who introduced Merlin and Susan to each other on a blind date back in high school. Though their uh, romance didn't really heat up until they got into college. Uh, but I take great pleasure, one of my great achievements of my life uh, is uh, having some role in who uh, Merlin chose as a mate for, for life. Uh, moving on. Uh, in 1958 to 62, I was a student at Caltech, and I want to tell the students who are here, I struggled. I had a really tough time for the first year and a half. Uh, I discovered very quickly that uh, my mind was a lot slower than most of the other uh, Caltech students. And so I had to find some way to master the material more effectively, despite my mind working slower. One of the techniques that I developed was that I worked out in my own way all of the most important results that I was learning about physics and mathematics in notebooks. And I have notebook after notebook after notebook that has my own derivations, my own explanations for myself of everything that was really important that I learned then and since. I continued those on throughout most of my career. Uh, and uh, during the summers while I was in uh, high school, I worked at Thiokol Chemical Corporation uh, together with some engineers uh, doing design work uh, for solid propellant rockets that ultimately propelled uh, the, uh, the uh, boosters that, uh, that took people to the space station. Uh, and we blew up rocket after rocket after rocket because we didn't get the design quite right. That was a real uh, lesson to me about how things can go wrong, but also that uh, this was my first experience with big science, where you had to get together with a number of other people to really pull something off successfully. And ultimately, it was successful. I went on to graduate school at Princeton University. This is a photograph of John Wheeler, who was my PhD advisor. Uh, he was a wonderful man who gave fabulous lectures. Uh, he would draw on the blackboard. This is before the days of, uh, of uh, uh, computer-generated graphics. He would draw on the blackboard uh, for several hours before a lecture, and then he would just talk about what he had on the lecture. And from him, I learned about Einstein's relativity theory and about warp space and warp time. And this is how I really got my start in working on black holes and gravitational waves. I returned to Caltech in 1966, uh, and uh, I started to build at Caltech a research group of my own working in this same area with black holes and uh, gravitational waves. Uh, and this is my research group and a number of visitors uh, a few years after that. Stephen Hawking here will be the one who's recognizable. Uh, I'm here. 
there was a lot of hair in the beard. The hair is gone, but the beard is, is still here. <laughs> <laughs> I like to try to keep the beard the same color as uh, it was then. It takes some work. <laughs> but I, I do keep it the same color with, with the aid of a hairdresser. Uh, except for just a little white in the center, just to let you know that uh, this is not totally meant. <laughs> so I now want to start talking about warped space. <clears throat> and I like this drawing done by an artist friend of mine uh, named Leah Halloran. Uh, this is like a Dr. Seuss drawing. Uh, you imagine you're an ant and you live on this surface. And this surface is your whole universe your whole universe. And there are routes that you can go from here to there without having to go around the uh, surface. You can go across a shortcut called the wormhole. Uh, and uh, there are also in here black holes, which are basically like failed wormholes. But a black hole is not something you can travel through. If you go down through the surface of the black hole, you can never ever get out because gravity is so strong it prevents you from ever getting out. Of course, in our universe, we have three dimensions. I'm showing you a two-dimensional universe that the, you would live on if you were an ant crawling on it. But we have the same kind of thing with uh, black holes and possibly wormholes in our universe, although our universe is three-dimensional. So the surface of this black hole looks like a circle here, but of course it's really a sphere because a circle in three dimensions becomes a sphere. So here, the surface of a black hole is like a black sphere, and things can fall into it, and nothing can come out. The, uh, when I raise myself back to where these, it becomes a three-dimensional universe, then the, the region that this is bent around in is the fourth dimension. It's called the bulk by physicists. The bulk is the fourth dimension that our universe is curved up inside. Uh, now, in the movie Interstellar, for those of you who saw it, it's called the fifth dimension instead of the fourth. Why? Because time is a fourth dimension, and so it got boosted up to the fifth dimension in the movie. But it's the fourth space dimension, and I will think about that in that way in the talk. Let me talk, say, tell you a little bit about black holes and what we learned about black holes uh, in our studies, uh, in my research group, Stephen Hawkins in their search group, and, and others. A uh, black hole then is seen in the fourth dimension, but removing one dimension. So I'm showing it just an equatorial slice through the black hole. And this is what it looks like when you look in from the fourth dimension, from the higher dimension. It looks like this funnel. Uh, and the horizon of the black hole is there, that circle that becomes a sphere when I, re uh, when I bring the other the missing dimension back in. I have a star over here. I have a camera down there. And light rays from this star can travel around the black hole in one direction, on one side, like that. But there's also a light ray that can come around on this side. There's also a light ray that can come around, sweep around the black hole once and come to the camera. And you can just imagine a light ray can go around the black hole a number of times because space is so warped around that black hole. And so that's why it is that you get this strange pattern here. That you can have, have a star that appears here, but it also appears over there, and it appears a number of times down there, very close to the horizon. Uh, these are the images that come along these different light rays. And so that's how we get this complicated uh, uh, pattern here. That is the gravitational lensing. Now, time slows as you near a black hole. Far away, time flows at the same rate as it does here on Earth. You get down very near the black hole, and time flows very slowly. And in the movie Interstellar, you see this, where Matthew McConaughey goes down near a black hole on a planet that's very close to a black hole. And he's there for a few hours and comes back out. And his daughter has aged uh, uh, by about uh, 20 years while he was down near, near the black hole. And so uh, time is enormously slow near a black hole. Uh, and light at the horizon of the black hole as time is stopped if you hover there in your spacecraft. If you fall through the black hole, you discover that time flows downward toward what's called a singularity down inside the black hole. A singularity where the laws of physics as we know them break down, fail, and a new set of physical laws called the laws of quantum gravity take over and control that singularity. And the holy grail of theoretical physics these days is to understand those laws of quantum gravity. I'll return to that issue right at the end of this talk. Um, 
And so one of the reasons you can't get out of a black hole is because time is flowing downward inside the black hole in a direction that you would have thought was a space direction. And you cannot move against the flow of time. You might be able to make time machines where you go out and arrive back before you went out. But you cannot sit here and go against the flow of time, backward, directly against the flow of time. That's absolutely forbidden by the laws of physics. These are issues in which I have struggled and many of my colleagues have struggled over the last few decades. But you have two black holes that circle around each other, collide and merge. They produce gravitational waves. This is a drawing then that was done by an artist when we were just starting this LIGO project to try to discover gravitational waves. Uh, and this is, uh, we imagine that the gravitational wave can travel out, as I told you, from the black hole that we did discover, the collision, black hole collision we did discover, traveling out to Earth. Now, what are these gravitational waves more precisely? They're predicted to exist by Albert Einstein in 1960. And what they do is they stretch and squeeze space. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> If you lay out a bunch of particles in space, up in space, not down here, because if you're down here, they're going to fall through the floor, uh, fall to the floor. And out, up in space, they're just sitting there at rest with respect to each other. When a gravitational wave comes by, traveling out of the uh, screen towards you, what it does is it stretches space along this direction and squeezes space along that direction. And these particles ride with the stretching and squeezing space. And so the pattern of particles is stretched, and this is an oscillatory stretching and squeezing. So it's stretched along this direction, squeezed along that, and then the next half cycle is squeezed along this direction, stretched along that direction, and just over and over stretching and squeezing. This is very different from an electromagnetic wave, as I will explain in a moment. In 1972, at Caltech. I had been at Caltech then by six year, for six years. I had been studying gravitational waves as a theorist. I had not thought much about experiments to uh, try to detect gravitational waves. But uh, a friend of mine named Joseph Weber had built a gravity wave detector, had hoped to see, thought maybe he'd seen gravitational waves, had not seen them. But this got me thinking, uh, what could we do with gravitational waves if you could really discover them? And so my students and I began to develop a vision for what gravitational wave astronomy would be like. What kinds of things could you do with it? Well, the key to this is that this stretching and squeezing is not just a regular pattern. It's a stretch, say, and squeeze as a function of time. That if I put it on a graph, it might be a slow stretch, then a faster and faster stretch and squeeze, stretch, squeeze, stretch, squeeze, then rapid oscillations, and then slower, and then maybe die out. This is just a hypothetical pattern or waveform, gravitational waveform as we call it. And that would carry energy. And if, if you, those of you who have ever seen somebody take a sound wave and put it on an oscilloscope, you see the same kind of a thing. You see a pattern of just this kind of a sort that shows you what the wave shape is that produces the sound that you hear in your ear as it, as these waves arrive in your ear and they pound on your ear. And just as these sound waves can carry the, uh, the music from a symphony, very complex uh, information in a, uh, coming off of the symphony orchestra. Similarly, gravitational waves can carry a huge amount of information in these complicated oscillations. And so our goal then was to discover gravitational waves and look at the shapes of these oscillations and from them extract the information the waves are bringing to us from distant phenomena in this now let me describe electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. These are just the only two forms of waves that are allowed to exist by the laws of nature as we understand them. Uh, the only two forms of waves that can travel across intergalactic and interstellar space bringing us information from far away. The electromagnetic waves include light, radio waves, x-rays, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, microwaves, these are all electromagnetic, and they just consist of electric and magnetic forces that oscillate back and forth as they travel at the speed of light. That's the physical mechanism. Gravitational waves, as I've described, instead are oscillations of the very fabric, the shape of space time, of space itself, uh, with some uh, oscillations also occurring in time that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, electromagnetic waves are emitted by electrically charged particles, for example, electrons 
and then transmission antenna for a radio station, oscillating up and down in that transmission antenna, uh, producing the electromagnetic waves. Gravitational waves, by contrast, are emitted by the bulk motion of huge bodies, either changing their shapes, like oscillating, or moving in some complicated manner, like the two black holes going around each other. But it's the mass, the huge amount of mass, that is producing these waves, not the little oscillating electrical charge. Electromagnetic waves are uh, very easily absorbed and scattered, so that we actually see only a fraction, I'm not sure what it is, 20-30% uh, of our galaxy we can see with electromagnetic waves. The rest is just uh, block, black, blocked out because there's too much dust between us and those regions of the galaxy. Gravitational waves, by contrast, are extremely penetrating. They traveled upward to the Earth to our gravity wave detectors completely unscathed. They penetrate through everything even very hot matter in the birth of the universe. They are the only form of radiation that could be created in the birth of the universe and bring us information about the very early moments of the universe. And so this is the glory of them, that they are so penetrating. And because they are so different from electromagnetic waves, it was clear to me, my students and my colleagues, as early as 1972, that many gravitational wave sources will not be seen electromagnetically. And we have seen no electromagnetic waves from our colliding black holes. Only gravitational waves. That's an example. Others will see, we will see both electromagnetic and gravitational waves. And huge surprises are likely to happen because our current knowledge of the universe has almost all come from electromagnetic waves. And these gravitational waves are produced so differently, they're so much more penetrating, they're going to show us sides of the universe that we've never seen before. So, by 1972, it seemed to me that if there was a real possibility to detect gravitational waves, this is something I wanted to be involved in, and I would devote to uh, as much of my career as was needed, and, uh, that, that I, as a theorist, could help the experimenters who build gravity wave detectors to uh, discover the gravitational wave and extract their information. Rainer Weiss, who became a very close personal friend of mine as a professor at MIT, I first met him when I was a graduate student. He was a postdoctoral student at Princeton uh, in the early 1960s. In 1972, he wrote a little technical paper in which he described the type of gravity wave detector that became the kind of detector that we ultimately built uh, together to detect gravitational waves. Four mirrors that hang from overhead supports, a big separation between these mirrors and those mirrors, four kilometers in LIGO, and in the end is what we had. Uh, and so this is very small compared to that. This is uh, squashed out in those arms. These we call these two arms of an L. Gravitational waves take hold, they stretch space along this direction while they're squeezing along that direction. So these mirrors are pushed apart, those together, then in the next half cycle, these are pushed apart, and those are pushed together. And we use laser beams and a technique called interferometry to monitor that motion. And uh, so this was the basic idea. I'm not going to go into technical details, but I am going to tell you that in 1972, a matter of uh, just a few months after Ray wrote that technical paper, before I had really studied his paper, but I'd heard the idea, and it was obvious to me that this was not a very promising uh, technique for electrical gravitational waves, and so I said so in a textbook that I wrote called Gravitation, uh, together with my thesis advisor, John Wheeler and Charlie Minzer. Uh, and, uh, that, I said this is not very promising, and then I wound up spending most of my career helping Ray uh, uh, pull this all off. <laughs> so why did I say it wasn't very promising? Let me tell you how much motion you have in these mirrors back and forth. In LIGO, in the end, this is four kilometers. So we knew already at that time, I had a pretty good idea how strong the waves were, and uh, Ray had a pretty good idea and, and, and we understood the physics of how this gravity wave detector would work. So since I knew roughly how strong the waves were, we knew how much motion they would produce in these mirrors. So let me tell you how much motion. I begin with one centimeter, which is, what, roughly a quarter of an inch. Uh, and uh, you divide it by 100 and you get the thickness of a human hair. You divide it by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that's 
being used to monitor the motion of these mirrors. Divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom. Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of the nucleus at the center of an atom. Divide by 100, you get the size of the motion that we expect you to see. And I looked at that. I said, this guy is either stupid or crazy or something. Uh, and so I was very mild in my word. Uh, it's not very promising. Uh, and then I studied his paper. I should have studied it before. <laughs> we were under a hard deadline for the publisher. We hadn't get the book yet. So, you know, this kind of mistake happens too frequently. Anyway, and so I studied his paper, and then I had long conversations with Ray and with other colleagues, and I became convinced. And so the rest is history that uh, I uh, teamed up with Ray. Uh, for the period from 78 to 83 at Caltech, which is the place where I went uh, after graduate school. Uh, I created a research group working on gravitational wave detection, brought in an experimenter to lead it. I'm just a theorist, there's no way that I can lead that research group. Brought a guy uh, named Ronald Dream from Glasgow. Uh, and uh, Ron and his team built a prototype gravitational wave detector, the kind of thing that Reagan proposed, with only 40 meter arms, 1% as long as what was needed in the end. But nevertheless, that's half a football field length. So this system is half a football field length, but 1% of uh, what we ultimately were going to need in life. Uh, at the meantime, at uh, MIT, in that same period, Ray completed the uh, construction of a much smaller prototype that you see here in the background, the vacuum pipe that he's in. Uh, and he and his team did a feasibility study, a serious feasibility study, uh, together with a bunch of engineers from industry, of all the problems that you would run into in trying to build a four kilometer instrument. And uh, how much was it going to cost? And what kind of technical engineering issues were you going to have to uh, face up to? kinds of things that, that, that Bruce is an expert in, uh, having uh, spent his career uh, working in engineering, and the kinds of things that I've tried to learn, because I had to work on this thing in, in order to help help uh, uh, my experimental colleagues pull it off. I actually took a lot of pleasure in trying to learn some engineering and helping out with some of the engineering design of the uh, instrument we built. So anyway, this feasibility study was done then in uh, 1980 to 83. And uh, based on the results that came off of our prototype detectors and the feasibility study, Caltech and MIT got together and created the LIGO project. Uh, and uh, initially, the LIGO project was led by Ray and me and Ronald Drever, the Caltech experimenter. We were the most dysfunctional leadership that I think science has ever seen. So we had to bring in a single director who knew how to uh, make big projects happen. I'll talk about that in a moment. 1989, then, we proposed to the U.S. National Science Foundation constructing LIGO. Uh, we said we would first build facilities, the vacuum system and so forth, the poles, the laser beams, and the mirrors. Uh, we'd build the facilities uh, first, and then we would build an initial set of gravity wave detectors, we call them interferometers, uh, that uh, would not, we were unlikely to have good enough sensitivity to see anything. But, uh, and then we would build, with the knowledge we got from having built these initial detectors, we would build a second generation of advanced detectors that would very likely see a lot of gravitational waves. So that was the plan as we laid it out. Uh, we struggled to get funding. It's not common in astronomy. It's never, never been done, I think, before. Uh, to say you're going to build an initial instrument at a cost of $300 million, and so you're not going to see any of this. And then you're going to have to upgrade some additional costs, and then uh, you'll probably see something. Uh, but we did manage to convince uh, the National Science Foundation and Congress by 1992 uh, that this was a serious, we had a real shot of success. The payoff, if we succeeded, would be so high that it would be well worth the money. And the money in the end was $1.1 billion of your money, the taxpayer money. And I thank you all for your contribution. <laughs> And I have to say that from 1992 onward, uh, Congress and the National Science Foundation backed us fully. We never had severe budget cuts from what uh, our plan had said we needed. 
uh, and they backed us all the way through, whether the Republicans were in control of Congress and the presidency or the, or the Democrats. Uh, it was a unanimous uh, enthusiasm for the project, and they all took enormous pride in the success when it was ultimately pulled off. The person we brought in to really lead the project was a guy named Barry Barish, uh, and it was Barry and I and Ray Weiss that they are the icons for the project that got the Nobel Prize. Uh, he led us in the construction of the facilities in 95 to 99. He led us in expanding uh, the project beyond just Caltech and MIT into a far larger collaboration because the task of doing this was so done. Measuring the motion of mirrors, you want them to be pushed only by gravitational waves when the Earth under the mirrors is vibrating back and forth a billion times larger motion just due to wind blowing on trees and the roots of the trees rising and falling and shaking the earth uh, under the gravity wave detectors, or rain falling and that shaking the earth under the gravity wave detectors. A billion times larger motion, you've got to get that all out of the data and see only the motion caused by the gravity waves. There's so many things to go wrong. These had to be tremendously complicated instruments and it took a huge team of a thousand people from 80 institutions now in 18 nations to pull this off. And they are the ones that uh, really deserve the credit and the Nobel Prize. Uh, in 2000 to 2010, we built the initial interferometers. They saw nothing. 2010 to 2015, the advanced interferometers were installed uh, and ready to go. But in the meantime, there was another leg that had to go on, something else. We had to know the shapes of the waves in order to be able to search for the waves. We had to know the shapes of the waves in order to look at a wave shape and say, oh, that agrees, that's the same as you'll get from these two colliding black holes. The only way we could compute the wave shapes is by solving Einstein's relativity equations in situations where we don't know how to solve them by pencil and paper. It had to be computer simulations, numerical solutions on, uh, on supercomputers. And so in 2001, I left myself day-to-day -day involvement line. Another reason I really should not have been the one who got the Nobel Prize. I was not in the, the end game, but I left in order to start a collaboration working on these computer simulations, a collaboration with Saul Tukolsky from Cornell, a former student of mine uh, from many years earlier. And uh, we did have the simulations that were needed in time in 2015. Uh, and uh, in fact, by then we had done simulations of collisions of a thousand different pairs of black holes, each with different sizes, uh, different spins. These arrows are the axes around which the black holes spin, and the length of the arrow uh, corresponds to how fast they're spinning. And so we did a thousand different pairs of black holes with different sizes and different spins in order to build up a catalog for each pair of black holes uh, with the size of their spins and a direction of the Earth, you get particular shapes of the waves, and it turns out that there are two waves with two different polarizations, to use a technical phrase, that come off from a black hole collision. And LIGO sees only one, but we rely on our European partners to see the other waveforms. So you get two waveforms. It's like the two polarizations you have uh, in life, and you can use Polaroid filters or Polaroid glasses to wipe out one of the polarizations and see the other. The discovery, 14 September 2015, the signal came in. We thought it would be so weak that we would have to drag it out of the noise uh, with by data analysis. It was so strong you could see it by eye. There it is in Livingston, Louisiana, one of our gravity wave detectors in uh, Hanford, Washington. When it was cleaned up, and the noise was uh, removed by various techniques, it looked like the gray uh, pattern. And the red line is from the computer simulations from our uh, Caltech Cornell project. Beautiful agreement with the assumption, beautiful agreement, if in fact the black holes were 29 solar masses, 29 times heavier than the sun, and 36 times heavier than the sun, that means a total of 65 times as heavy as the sun. Collided and burned, and produced a final black hole that was only 62 times as heavy as the sun. And so three solar masses was gone as gravitational wave energy. And so that came from comparing with the simulations. And we also got from this the distance 1.3 million light years. But we could not have gotten that information without the simulations. And so it was crucial to have simulation and experiment. And so what did this collision actually look like is seen from a higher dimension, is seen from the bulk. And so 
We can go back to the computer, computer simulations and uh, the uh, team that did those simulations, uh, the Caltech Cornell team, uh, uh, then made this movie uh, of what it would look like as you look in from the fourth dimension. And you see the two black holes, funnels, like we saw before, going down. Uh, the color coding is the slowing of time. So where it's red, time is flowing very slowly. Where it's black, that's inside the black hole. And we just watch as the two black holes go around and around each other. I'm going to put it in slow motion. And when it goes into slow motion, then we're getting very close to the collision. Uh, the, uh, it should be going in slow motion now. I hope it's in slow motion. Yeah, it's okay. Now we go. And now look at the huge splash in the shape of space. The deep red where time is very slow. I'm going to stop it right when the collision occurs. And it's like a splash of a huge ocean wave in a storm. And then it oscillates and dies out and the gravitational waves go flying away. And that was the black hole collision. It was the fir human's first encounter uh, with colliding black holes and first encounter with gravitational waves. And that's what it would have looked like if you were a bulk being living in the bulk, if you lived in the higher dimension looked in. And this is the way we visualize black hole collisions because all the, the black holes are not made for matter. They're made only for warp space and time. The essence of the black hole is what you saw, it's just what it would look like uh, from a higher dimension, the color coding showing the slowing of time. Um, we have seen five, five black hole collisions, different, different masses, uh, different uh, distances from Earth, and we're beginning to build up some understanding then of people colliding black holes in the universe. Uh, we have had trouble with just the lighting detectors identifying where in the sky these uh, colliding black holes were. Uh, and this is the uncertainty error box. It was somewhere inside this region. Then we just mapped the whole sky around the Earth onto this sphere. Uh, and these are the error boxes on those five black hole collisions. And one of them is tiny. Something major happened to enable us to point and say where this uh, source was in the sky. But what happened is that the Europeans got their act together. Uh, a collaboration of France, Italy, and the other ones, Poland and Hungary, called the Virgo Project. 19 labs, 250 plus, uh, and, and, uh, two more scientists and 250, I don't know how many more now. They have their own gravity wave detector, and it came online uh, about one year ago, August 1st of, uh, of last year. It came online just in time to see this on the 14th of August, to also see this gravitational wave source. And we were able then to triangulate. You get the direction of the source by the time delay in the arrival of the signal at three different detectors on the Earth. When we had only LIGO detectors, we knew it came from the south. We could say it came from somewhere near the Antarctic Peninsula, because the signal arrived in Livingston, Louisiana, before it arrived in Hanford, Washington. So it was in sort of along the direction between uh, Livingston and Hanford. With three detectors, we could pin it down in this uh, small area. And at that point, we could tell the electromagnetic astronomers, go look, go look quick, and see if you see anything. And so we send out, we send out uh, alerts that we may have seen a gravity wave signal, and we tell them where it is, and uh, when it occurred. And they look as quick as they can and see if they can see anything. So they were doing that. They saw nothing uh, from uh, the black hole collisions. But on August 17th of last year, they saw a huge burst of electromagnetic radiation coming off of one of our gravity wave sources. And that gravity wave source turned out to be not two black holes that collided, but two neutron stars that collided. Each neutron star was about the size of Logan. Uh, it had a mass about one and a half times the mass of the sun, all packed into a region about the size of the globe. The density at the core of the neutron star is ten times higher than density in the core in an atomic nucleus. Unbelievably high density. Uh, and these, black, these neutron stars orbit around and around each other, as you see in this animation. And gravity waves are being emitted, and they spiral together due to losing energy in gravitational waves. They collided, they merged, they produced a fireball that went flying out and produced first gamma rays. This was very opaque, it was very dense matter. 
So the first thing you could get out was the highest energy form of ra electromagnetic radiation that could come out. It was gamma rays. And then a little later, X-rays. Then a little later, ultraviolet radiation, then light, then infrared radiation. The last thing to come out was the radio waves. And it was just a fantastic event. It was called a kilonova. Theorists had theorized about these kinds of things before, but we had very little observational information about them. And it was just like the theory said it should be, computer simulations and other theory. Now, the gravity wave signal, I'm not going to talk about the details here. But the key thing is that 1.7 seconds after the uh, merger of the two black holes, gamma rays came in from this little region in the sky. I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is the region where the gravity waves were coming from, as seen by LIGO and Virgo, this small region of the sky. The gamma rays came from that much larger region. We only knew it the gamma rays were from somewhere in here. But X-rays, ultraviolet, optical red the radio waves, you could see those with much higher precision to see that they were coming from a galaxy sitting down in there. So the galaxy was thereby identified. And from the details of the electromagnetic waves, you could conclude that the theory was correct. This is the place where the gold in your wedding rings came. Not this particular collision, but from neutron star collisions. Gold and platinum and the other precious metals are made predominantly from these kinds of collisions with neutron stars. So Nobody had ever seen evidence of colliding neutron stars before. Nobody had ever seen gravity waves from black hole collisions, from neutron star collisions. They had not seen electromagnetic waves from uh, neutron star collisions. But now this big set of observations that involved 20% of all the astronomers in the world, combining all of their efforts together, uh, were able to uh, deduce that the theory was right, and this is where the gold and platinum on Earth comes from these kinds of collisions. And, uh, and Many other exciting results came out of that. So these are just a photographs of a bit about our not flying gravity wave detectors. You saw that before. Down inside the uh, central building, these are the vacuum uh, tanks in which the mirrors hang from overhead supports. Uh, Barry Barris likes to put a baseball player here so you can see the size of it. Uh, these are the vacuum tubes down which the laser beams go. This is a mirror hanging from overhead support. It is truly hanging, uh, supported by a, a uh, by a, a fuselage of quartz fiber, although it has a lot of uh, other stuff around it. So for example, catch it if, it, if there's an earthquake and it falls. You don't want it to fall to the earth and break. Um, so the gravity wave comes along and it pushes it back and forth by that tiny amount, and the legs should be mounting off, off of this, and uh, uh, then measures the motion. There are 100,000 data channels come out of this instrument. 100,000, one of which is the gravitational wave signal. All the rest are telling you about what is going on inside the instrument or in the surrounding environment so that you can see whether everything is working all right or not. You can see, uh, get a real sense as to whether everything is okay. And that is just to measure how complex these instruments are. Advanced LIGO is now shut down for about 15 months. It'll turn back on around January. Shut down uh, because the uh, instruments are only are a factor of three worse in their sensitivity than they were designed to be. And this is not, should not be surprising. The instruments are so complex that it's rather like, uh, uh, like uh, Frankenstein who built his monster but didn't discover it was a monster until it came to life. He uh, only learned the personality of this creature after the creature was brought to life. These things, they are so complex they have their own personality. They only learn the personality by poking and prodding. So they're doing experiments to learn his personality, poke it toward design sensitivity, and we will see three times farther into the universe, a volume of three cubed to 27 times greater uh, by about 2020. <coughs> Just uh, about two years from now, we expect to be there. Uh, and we should be seeing then one black hole collision per day. And by tw the 2030s, with further improvements, we should see every black hole collision in the entire universe for black holes smaller than a few hundred times as heavy as the sun. Uh, further improvements. Uh, that's not all. By the 2030s, we will have three other kinds of gravity wave detectors operating in the three different frequency bands or three different periods of oscillation of gravitational waves. I'm not going to tell you the details of it. But LIGO looks at gravity waves in periods of roughly a millisecond. 
something called NISA, which is three spacecraft that track each other with laser beams and it's out in space. Uh, Gravitational uh, waves are periods of minutes to hours. Something called pulsar timing arrays, graduation periods of years to decades, and something called CMB polarization, which I won't talk to in detail about, periods of hundreds of millions of years. Now, of course, hundreds of millions of years is more than a gra graduate student lifetime. <laughs> so you don't sit here and watch as a graduate student with the oscillation of the What you see are patterns of what is called CMB or microwave polarization on the sky. Uh, that are produced by those oscillations. Uh, but this to give you some sense that uh, with electromagnetic waves we have optical astronomy, x-ray astronomy, radio astronomy, gamma ray astronomy. Uh, here we're going to have four different kinds of gravitational astronomy, similarly in four different kinds of that. So I want to wind up by telling you about what I think is the most exciting aspect of this that's going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, which I trust is going to be another decade or two. I'm counting on uh, one two. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love it to be more. So exploring the first one second of our universe is life. First thing that I think we're likely to do that is really exciting is to watch the birth of the fundamental forces. It's a little hard to wrap your head around it. The electromagnetic force, the electric force and the magnetic force, they are wrapped up together. They're two aspects of the same thing, according to Einstein. And they are one of the fundamental forces. Gravity is another fundamental force. And then there are two more fundamental forces that control atomic nuclei and then physics of fundamental particles, called the weak force and the strong force. These forces did not exist at the beginning of the universe. They came into being after the Big Bang. And as the universe expanded, according to the theory, as it expanded and cooled, the nature of the forces themselves changed. And so in particular, when the universe was about 10 to the minus 12 seconds old, a trillionth of a second old, before that, the electric and magnetic force didn't even exist. The equations that governed it, called Maxwell equations, they were irrelevant. They didn't have anything to do with our universe. But as the universe cooled, that force, uh, so let me just say, something that did exist was something called the electroweak force. As the universe cooled, the electroweak force transformed itself into the electromagnetic force as one fundamental force and the weak force as the other fundamental force. So those two fundamental forces came into being. They were given birth uh, uh, at age a trillionth of a second. And this happened inside bubbles that are rather like raindrops, except that these bubbles then, uh, where the forces were separate, the electromagnetic force existed inside here, did not exist out, outside of there. They expanded at the speed of light, collided, merged, produced strong bursts of gravitational waves, according to the theory. Those bursts of gravitational waves expanded, as the universe expanded, they expanded in their wavelength until today they are in the wavelength band for LISA. And so we are look, we'll look with Lisa when this, uh, uh, this particular new kind of gravity detector comes on board with three spacecraft craft that track each other uh, out in space with laser beams. And they, uh, when uh, they begin to operate, we will then be looking for the gravitational waves from the birth of the electromagnetic force. We want to watch how the electromagnetic force came into being when the universe was a trillion of a second old. Primordial gravitational waves from the very big bang, the very beginning of the universe, are predicted to have come off and in the front, uh, and traveled outward through the universe, and have begun extremely weak. And uh, in the first 10 to the minus 33 seconds of the universe, an unbelievably small amount of time, the universe went through what is thought to be something called inflation, where it expanded extremely rapidly and then the expansion slowed. And that inflation is thought to have amplified these uh, primordial gravitational waves to the, make them strong enough that we have a good shot at seeing them. But they were otherwise they were unaffected. They were amplified, but otherwise unaffected. They traveled outward through the universe, and when the universe was 380,000 years old, the uh, a very hot gas, and I'm going to get so lightly technical now, it, uh, recombined. It was so hot that the electrons were not attached to protons, it was to form neutral atoms. 
At that age, they attach God as the universe cooled, and the electrons then cease to be free, and they stop scattering the uh, electromagnetic waves. And the electromagnetic waves from then travel to Earth, and today we see them as microwaves. So we see cosmic microwaves, or CMB as they call it, coming from all directions of the sky. The gravitational waves interacted with the hot gas at this time and put this polarization pattern, as we call it, onto these microwaves. This is quite technical. The key point is that we're not going to see the gravitational waves themselves, but we see the pattern that they place on this microwave radiation that comes to the, uh, from age 380,000 years uh, 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 to us. And we will look out, we will see that, we expect. And from that pattern of polarization, we will infer the properties of the gravitational wave that came off of the Big Bang. And the properties are going to be a combination of the amplification effect of the inflation that made these uh, gravitational waves strong enough to be seen, uh, and what came off the Big Bang itself. And I really look forward to the uh, cherished beliefs of theorists as to what came off the Big Bang that turned out to be wrong. Theorists think they know what came off the Big Bang, so they think they know what this pattern's going to be. And I would wait to pretty high odds that they will be wrong, and we're going to have a huge mystery to try to solve when this happens. And this could be within the next five years. Uh, and then later, around 2050, we will directly see the gravitational waves with much shorter periods of oscillation, periods of seconds, uh, with LISA-type spacecraft uh, that gravity wave detectors in orbit around the sun. This is a, a, another story. But so by around 2050, we should be seeing the gravitational waves from the Big Bang uh, in two different ways with two different types of instruments. So let me just wind up by saying that it's 400 years ago that Galileo built a small optical telescope and pointed it at Jupiter and discovered the four moons of Jupiter, the four biggest moons of Jupiter, pointed at our moon and discovered the craters on the moon. It's two years ago that LIGO uh, observed, well, it's three years ago almost, I think it's like a year ago. It's three, nearly three years ago that LIGO discovered its first gravitational waves from colliding black holes. When you think about the huge changes in our knowledge of the universe that have come from electromagnetic waves in the 400 years since Galileo, I invite you to think about, to speculate about what changes in our understanding of the universe will come in the next 400 years from the combination now that we now have of both gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves.